thank you so much for participating uh, today. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to remind everybody that this meeting is uh, being recorded. And uh, if you are willing to participate in the recording, please you know, leave your video on. There'll be questions and, and other ways for you to participate later. Um, and if you prefer not to be videotaped, please uh, keep uh, your video off and, and you can just ask questions through the, your audio. So thank you again. Uh, welcome um, on behalf of Young Women in Bio. I'm uh, really happy to once again, uh, being able to open this uh, event um, by the GCSS, the Goodman Cancer Student Society, um, at the Goodman, normally at the Goodman Cancer Center. Um, we've worked with them and with uh, some of you uh, for a number of years now, and it has always been uh, an excellent event. And I have some wonderful pictures from uh, previous years. Unfortunately, we won't be able uh, to do that. But I just wanted to let you know, our, our mandate is uh, really to be promoting um, the curiosity of science. So many of us have had such a wonderful career in science and to make sure that that curiosity um, gets shared with uh, young people like yourselves. So without uh, more to do, uh, I will introduce you uh, to Pascal, who is the vice chair of uh, the Young Women in Bio group that we have here in Montreal so that she can uh, introduce you to some of the people that have put in a lot of work to make sure today turns out well. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm Pascal. It's a pleasure to see all of you. I'd like to introduce you to Mara and Gabe, these wonderful volunteers who did so much for us to organize this event. They were involved in the organization of this event last year and they took the lead this year and we are very grateful because it is a lot of work and they did a fantastic job. Um, Mara, I'll introduce first, she's in Dr. Luke McCaffrey's lab. Um, she's doing her master's but she's transferring to her PhD in January which is a big decision and challenge and she should be very proud and she is working on understanding the earliest stages of breast cancer initiation. Um, Gabe is doing her PhD and she's co-supervised by Dr. Chris Morais and Dr. Morag Park. So she's at the interface of cancer research and biomedical engineering. And she's working on understanding the forces and non-cancerous cells that impact the tumor um, within the tumor that impact the triple negative breast cancer progression. So they have great projects and uh, yeah, so they organize this wonderful event. So get excited, get excited. It's going to be really interesting. So thank you all for coming. Awesome, thanks Pascal. Um, welcome guys. It's really awesome to be with you today. Um, I'm gonna start by introducing where we work, where Mara and I work, uh, which is the Rosalind and Morris Goodman Cancer Center. Um, it is a world-class research center, and the idea here is that we're contributing to um, innovative ideas in order to move cancer research forward. So there's more of a hundred of us in this building, and we're scientists, technicians, administration, undergraduate students, and graduate students. Um, and we work on a variety of different themes, um, breast cancer, um, embryonic development and how that impacts cancer, cancer stem cells, metabolism, and all sorts of things. Um, and so in a nutshell, our goal um, is to work sort of as a team to understand the complex nature of cancer and to establish um, collaborations between the researchers in this building so that we can move closer towards a cure for cancer. Um, and so, unfortunately, you don't get to come into the lab today. Um, so we're going to give you just a quick tour walking through the lab so that you get an idea of where we work and what it looks like um, and, and sort of how uh, messy or chaotic the lab can be. And, and I think that's kind of part of the fun of it. So um, I'll press play. Hopefully it works. Um, so you can see that there's fume hoods and there's all kinds of beakers and glassware. Um, and there's rows of benches. Um, you can see someone is at work. Um, 
yeah, that's basically it. Um, and so one thing to also note while you get to see around the lab a little is just that one of the things I love most about um, Young Women in Bio is that we get to connect with you guys and hear your thoughts and, and your questions. So I really encourage you to either to, to enter your questions into the chat and we'll either get to them today or we can um, afterwards draft up a bit of an email and send it back to the school so that your questions can be addressed. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea of what the lab looks like. Um, and I'm gonna pass it over to Mara because we're going to start a quiz. Oops. All right, thanks Gabe. Um, so yes, we are going to get started with a bit of a quiz. Uh, so if you could all go to the joinmyquiz.com, um, you can use your phone, your iPad if you're in class or your computer um, and enter the code on the screen. Um, and once everyone is logged in, we will get started. All right, great. Looks like some people are logging in. All right, we'll just give it a few more questions for everyone to log on and then we will get going. Right, so it looks like many of you have logged on, so let's get started. So you should be able to see the first question. Uh, so the first question is, who was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize in science? Was it Rosalind Franklin, Barbara McClintock, Donna Strickland, or Mary Curie? All right, so 10 seconds left, get your answers in. And the answer is Mary Curie. So it looks like most of you got that right, well done. Okay, next question. So the next question is, which of these scientists was not awarded the Nobel Prize? Was it Rosalind Franklin, Barbara McClintock, Donna Strickland, or Francis Arnold? All right, last few seconds, there we go. Uh, so that was a bit of a trickier question, um, but the answer for this one was Rosalind Franklin. All right, moving on. Our next question is, who performed the calculations by hand to send the first US astronaut into space? Was it Grace Hopper, Sally Ride, Barbara McClintock, or Katherine Johnson? Right, last few seconds. And looks like most of you got that right. It is Katherine Johnson. Okay, next question is, 
who was the first Canadian woman to win a Nobel Prize in physics? Was that Maria Gopert Mayer, Barbara McClintock, Donna Strickland, or Frances Arnold? This was pretty recent, so you may have heard of the name. All right, and time's up. The answer is Donna Strickland. Uh, she was actually, I believe, from Waterloo University, and that happened just a couple years ago. All right, uh, next question is, who is Henrietta Lacks, and what was her contribution to science? Was she a woman whose cervical cancer cells were taken without her consent to create the very first ever cell line? What cancer cell line? Um, was she the first female physician in the United States, the first female Nobel laureate, or the first female United States Surgeon General? All right, and looks like most of you got that one right. Well done. She. Uh, was uh, her cells were used to create the first cancer cell line and they're called HeLa cells because her name is Henrietta Lacks. I'm so impressed. I'm not sure I would have been able to get this many questions right. When yeah, I, I don't think I would have known that answer either. So good job. Good job guys. Okay, uh, so moving on, looks like you guys are getting this pretty quickly. Which organelle is the powerhouse of the cell? The nucleus, the mitochondria, the Golgi apparatus, or the endoplasmic reticulum? All right, last few seconds to get those answers in. And the answer is the mitochondria. So looks like most of you got that right. Well done. All right, uh, next question is, again, testing a little bit of your science knowledge that you're hopefully learning in your science class, which is not a DNA base? Is it adenine, guanine, cytosine, or threonine? All right, last few seconds. All right, so that one was a little bit trickier, um, but the answer is threonine. It's actually used to make proteins rather than DNA. Okay, another science question. What, where is DNA stored in the cell? Is it the nucleus, the mitochondria, the cytoplasm, or the endoplasmic reticulum? And be careful with this one. You have the option to choose more than one answer if you see fit. All right, so looks like you guys all got, or almost all got the nucleus, that's great, um, but a little bit of a trick, there's also DNA in the mitochondria, so well done to those of you who got that right. Um, all right, next question is, which cancer is most commonly diagnosed, is the most commonly diagnosed cancer in Canada? Do you think it is breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, lung cancer, or non-melanoma skin cancer? All right, I can't see this one, so hopefully you were able to, um, to see the questions, um, but the answer for that one is actually non-melanoma skin cancer. All right, um, carrying on. 
It is no longer showing up for me, but hopefully it shows up for you. Let me know in the chat if you can't see it. Um, but the next question is, what is the biggest risk factor for cancer? Is it smoking, age, heart disease, or sun exposure? All right, last few seconds there. And the answer is age. Okay. Uh, I believe we are moving on to our very last question for this part. And our question is, which treatments can be used for treating cancer? Chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, or immunotherapy? And you can pick more than one option for this question. All right, so last few seconds to get your answers in there. And the answer is all of the above. All right, so well done everyone uh, for participating. I couldn't see um, the answers for the last few, but hopefully everyone was able to participate in that. Uh, so moving on from the quiz, we're gonna move back to Zoom. Uh, and so we just thought we'd take a few minutes to just go through what exactly cancer is, because we've been talking about the fact that we do cancer research, but let's just go through a little bit of why that is important. Next slide. All right, so cancer is actually a group of many related diseases that all have to do with abnormal cells. So in order for us to understand what cancer is, we first need to understand cells. So cells, as I'm sure you're learning or you've already learned in uh, your uh, science class, are very small units that make up all living things, including the human body. So we're all made up of billions of cells and we have different types of cells to do different jobs, but all of our cells use the same genetic code to tell them what to do. So as you can see inside the nucleus of our cell, we have chromosomes and these are made up of thousands of genes that are long strings of DNA. And so this is the message that tells our cells what to do and when to do it. Next slide. So when our cell divides, the chromosomes get duplicated. Next slide. And then they get separated into two cells. But sometimes when the DNA is being replicated, there are mistakes that are made that lead to changes in this code. And so this is what we call mutation. And so normally our cells are very smart and they're able to go through and they're able to check for these mutations. Uh, and if they find them, they'll fix them. But in unfortunate situations, these mutations don't get caught and they stick around. So when our cell divides, we end up with mutations that are kept around. And so mutations can change the way that cells act. So normally cells are able to grow, they're able to divide, but they know when to stop growing and they also eventually die. But sometimes when we have mutations, this can cause cells to grow out of control and it can also cel cause cells to not die when they're supposed to. And this is when we get cancer cells. Next slide. So we get cancer when we have these abnormal cells growing out of control. Next. And so oftentimes what we can get is these cancer cells growing in a clump, which we call a tumor. And so tumors can damage the surrounding healthy tissues and make people very sick. And so another thing that can happen is we can have cells escaping from that tumor traveling to other parts of the body to form new tumors. And this is what we call metastasis. Next. So it's so important that we continue to study cancer and do cancer research because cancer is now the leading cause of death in Canada. About one in two people are estimated to be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime and one in four are thought to die from cancer. Next. So I know that those numbers sound very, very scary, but what's important to remember is that through all of the research that has been done and is being done around the world, things have gotten drastically better. So in the 1940s, only about 25% of people in Canada who were diagnosed were expected to survive that diagnosis, but now that number has increased to on average 60%. And there are even many cancers where that number is 80 or 90 or even higher than that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that is really, really incredible. And that's a result of all of the hard work from research and researchers and doctors doing cancer research. Next slide. 
So the battle with cancer has been going on for hundreds, if not thousands of years, but in the last 150 years or so, there have been some major advances that have been made in cancer research and treatments of cancer. Next. So one of the early advances that was made, it was in the late 1800s, where we had the first radical mastectomy performed by William Halstead. And this is a uh, form of surgery to remove breast cancer that is still used today. Next. We then had Marie and Pierre Curie discovering the radioactive element radium, which later went on to be used to treat cancer. We then had, in the mid-1900s, the very first successful chemotherapy treatment, which was used to treat childhood leukemia. Later, uh, in the next year, uh, we then had implementation of the PAP test uh, in the clinic. Uh, so that actually led to a decrease in uterine and cervical cancers by 70% because we were able to detect these earlier. Uh, then by 1954, we finally established the link between smoking and cancer. Uh, later on in the 1980s, we had the very first human cancer gene discovered called RAS. Uh, and in that same year, we also had uh, implementation of MRI scanning equipment inside of hospitals. Uh, then in the 90s, we had the discovery of the very first breast cancer gene called BRCA1, which you may have heard about. And then moving into the 21st century, we had um, the very first draft of the human genome published in 2001. In 2006, we had the release of the Gardasil vaccine, which you may have heard of, or many of you may have even received a version of this vaccine, which is against human papillomavirus and was able to successfully prevent against cervical cancer. And then finally, one of the most recent and very exciting advances that has been made is the development of immunotherapy, which is a very cool treatment that actually activates patients' immune systems so that their immune cells actually fight and kill the cancer in their body. Next slide. So over the last number of years, there have been huge advances that have been made in both diagnosing and treating cancer. And now we have better technology than ever. We have uh, new ways of doing research. We have new ways of sharing our data and of collaborating with doctors and with research teams from all around the world. So the future is sure to be filled with even more incredible breakthroughs, maybe even with the help of some of you in the audience today, uh, so that one day in hopefully the near future, we'll be able to find a cure for cancer. Next slide. Oops. So uh, hopefully that gives you a bit of a sense of what cancer is and why it's so important to study it. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or if you're in your classroom, uh, get your teacher to put them in the chat. Um, if there are any right now, I can answer those um, or if not, we will continue to the next section. So I'll just give a couple of seconds to type in the chat if you have any questions. All right, doesn't look like we have any questions right now. Um, so we will continue to the next part, which is another little quiz. Uh, so again, we're gonna go to the same site and just put in a different code this time. We have um, people logging in, Mara, because I can move to the next slide. Do you know? All right. Sorry, I was on mute. We've got 24 people right now, um, so we'll just give it um, another couple seconds for people to log in. Okay, so last couple of seconds, looks like we've got almost the same number as last time. 
So the quiz this time is a bit less of an information um, challenge. Um, what I wanted to start our discussion about like what careers you can do as a scientist, um, I wanted to ask what word or words come to mind when you hear the word scientist. Um, we're not gonna be able to go through- Sorry, can we wait? Oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry, we're just getting students to log the classes. Just 30 no seconds. problem. Thank you. Yeah, no so. problem. Just let us know when you're ready to go. Good, thank you. <laughs> okay, perfect. No worries. Okay, so um, this time it's less of a like an information kind of testing your knowledge quiz, as I said. Um, we wanted to know what word or words come to mind when you hear the word scientist. So you can fill in as many as you want. Um, we're not going to get to them today, um, but we'll definitely share with you what we come up with from this. And I think it gives us like a good indication of what you know, what you're interested in, stuff like that. So um, we'll give you just maybe one more minute to, to fill it in and then yes. we'll move on to discussing careers. So we had, the, we had just a couple of questions just to get a sense of where you guys were at. Um, the first one is just what type of career you'd pursue in the biological sciences. Um, if you were to choose to do that. Uh, so we'll just give a couple seconds for that. Looks like almost everyone has filled that in. Um, we'll have one more question. And then the last one will be what word comes to mind when you think of scientists. So that'll give sure. you a couple seconds to think of your answer. Sorry, I kind of jumped the gun there. <laughs> That's all right. Oh, very cool. So looks like um, researcher or physician, but also a number of you would be interested in being a lawyer or a writer or a university professor. So there are cool. a whole range of things um, that people could be doing. All right, next question. And so that question is, what skills do you think are important for a career in science? All right, last couple, last couple seconds to get those answers in. All right, and then the last question, as we mentioned already, is what word comes to mind when you think of the word scientist? So this could be anything uh, that you want. You can type it in um, and yeah, feel free to enter whatever word comes to mind. All right, thank you guys for your answers. Um, and we will continue with the next part. Cool, thanks Mara. Um, okay, so moving on. Um, I wanted to start by talking about the different kind of places um, that scientists can work in. So the two that I think were the first to be mentioned, um, just from the quick little feedback that we got from the quiz, were physicians and researchers, maybe um, like in a university setting. So those of us working at the Goodman Cancer Research Center, we fall under this university labs, and we might do more like traditional um, 
lab bench work science that you think of when you see a scientist maybe carrying a beaker, that kind of a thing. Um, and so the goal here can be really anything. It could be looking at gene therapy. It could be looking at cancer treatments. It could be looking at early initiation events of cancer. But the idea is that you're working in like a university lab setting. Um, but scientists, they can also work in the food industry. So this could be being like an inspector for food, a food chemist, um, doing things like microbiology control. Um, and there's often like technology around food um, development and, and growing of food and things like that. Um, we also heard lawyer. Um, I'm impressed that scientist and lawyer got connected because I think sometimes people are not able to recognize that there's a role for scientists. Um, in the legal world. So for example, this could be dealing with um, patents. So understanding, in this case, you have to understand the legal jargon around both the legal issues of it, as well as maybe the drugs or the technology or the innovative ideas that someone might be trying to patent. So to protect the idea or the discovery. Um, scientists also work in the cosmetic industry. So um, there's L'Oreal right here in Montreal, for example. Um, and here you might be involved in um, creating safer or more effective um, products or increasing like the efficacy of the product that's already on the market. Um, you could also work in sales and marketing as a scientist. So here you have to have an understanding of maybe the, again, the technology or the drug in order to advertise it to the right people. Because if you don't understand how it works or who it's for, it's often really difficult to figure out who needs it. Um, then there's also publishing. Um, and so in science, um, as a researcher, when we're discovering things and doing research, we aim to publish our results. And so this means that our results are available to other people at either other universities or other research sort of institutes um, so that they can see what we've done and build off of the ideas or the results that we've been able to generate. So it, it sort of forces that or it allows for that sort of collaboration of ideas, maybe without physically collaborating. Um, and so because of that, there's a lot of jobs in the publishing world where you're in charge of maybe proofreading or editing for these journals, um, as well as there's also just communicating these findings. So being able to take a really complex idea and communicate the medical or scientific findings to an audience that that's not in science. So um, yeah, you're writing it for a non scientific audience. Um, there's also the pharmaceutical industry. So you could be a lab technologist, you could be a sales representative, or you could be a researcher. And I think pharmaceutical is maybe something you also really strongly link to being a scientist. Um, and lastly, there's the government. And so I'm not sure, this is one that I'm also not sure that everyone would have recognized how important scientists are within the government. Um, and then we had COVID-19 and it hit and we needed people working in the government who could understand how COVID spread um, and the implications of that and how to sort of keep us all safe. And so the scientists in government there were responsible for making evidence-based or scientifically based decisions to keep, to keep us safe. Um, and so, um, in a nutshell, I just wanted to show you here that scientists don't just have to work on a lab bench. Um, and so we can, we have this sort of diverse range of careers that we could enter. And the reason for that is that because um, if you go off and you prefer, pursue a scientific degree, um, you come out with a diverse range of skills and these are all really valuable and really transferable. So um, being able to work independently, to problem solve, to understand and create new knowledge, to manage product, projects, these are all really important traits to, to um, help you succeed regardless of the sector that you could end up working in as a scientist. So um, then I kind of wanted to talk about the paths into these scientific careers. So I'm not super familiar with the Quebec system, but I think when you go into CGEP, it's called a stream when you choose, if you wanted to choose science. So you can go into CGEP, you can continue to study science, and then you could go off and do a bachelor's of science at a university. And so after you finish these degrees, um, you could become an animal technician, a biomed, a biomed lab technologist, you could do a nursing degree, you could work in radiation oncology, or you could work in the tech sector. So for me personally, um, after I did my bachelor's degree at McGill in science, 
Um, and when I was coming close to finishing, I realized that none of the jobs that I found on the market were like super of interest to me. They didn't feel like my um, like my calling. I don't know how else to call it. Um, but the thing I did learn in my undergrad was how much I enjoyed research. I spent a lot of time working in different labs and I learned that it was something that I really liked. So afterwards, um, I decided to pursue graduate school. And so in graduate school, you can either um, get a master's degree or go on to have a PhD. And so the difference though, is that graduate school is not like a professional school. So this isn't like going to medical school or to business or to law. Here, you have the goal of producing original research. Um, and by original research, I mean that nobody else has studied what you're about to study. And so you walk in and your goal is to have a thesis. So you might have a question and you spend your time as a graduate student looking for the answer. So maybe you enter graduate school and your question is, does compound X cause this type of cancer? Or does having this gene make you more susceptible to this type of cancer or, or something of the sort? Um, and both a master's and a PhD fall under this category of grad school, um, where a master's, you don't need to find as significant of findings, but you are still looking for the answers to a question. And a PhD is generally like a longer degree and you're expected to find more and more things. Um, and so some of the pros of graduate school, at least for me, is that you have very few courses. So it allows you to set your own schedule and research on your own time, and you can be involved in things outside of the lab. Um, you also, because you're generating knowledge that's sort of good for everyone, um, you are paid. So because it's kind of a bit like a job, it's not really a salary, it's not the best pay in the world, but you're being paid. You're not going into debt to keep going in school. And the other really cool thing about grad school is that it's super international. So um, there's conferences that are abroad. It's not uncommon for grad students to be sent to faraway places to present their work and learn about what's going on in their field. And also because, because we are going to these international conferences, we're meeting people who work at different universities studying similar things. And it allows us to collaborate and um, work with people in different places. And so after you finish a master's or PhD, um, you can go off and become a research assistant or a lab technician. And this can be in the university setting or in an industry setting. Um, you could work as a hospital lab analyst or quality control in industry. Um, you can also um, continue on on this academic path and do a postdoc and actually it doesn't have to be academic. You can do a postdoc in industry or um, in a lab in a university setting. And the goal here is still producing original research, but you're in a new environment and you're working with new people. So it allows you to gain more experience within a scientific domain of your choosing. And so um, from there, you can go off and you can be a research associate, um, you can work in a pharmaceutical lab, you can work in publishing or the government, and you can also go on to be a professor. Um, and so that sort of, um, so that sort of ties up all of these different domains that you can work in and all of the ways that you can get there and how at every step of the way you're sort of opening yourself up to, to different career opportunities. So hopefully it gives you a good indication of um, of where you can go with degrees in science. So um, we wanted to introduce you to a couple um, to a couple different scientists at the GCRC. So unfortunately, um, uh, Dana couldn't join us, but she is the head of the um, metabolomics core facility at the Goodman Cancer Research Center. And she also has a PhD in physical chemistry. So I visited her in the metabolomics core a while ago and took a video that I'm gonna share with you now. Um, the background noise is super loud and that's just because of <laughs> what the metabolomics core is like. So you'll just have to excuse that. Um, I hope. I'm going to stop screen sharing for one second. Sorry, I'm worried the sound will come through. There we go. Okay. Hi, my name is Dinah. I'm a scientist that works here at the Goodman Cancer Research Center. And welcome to the Metabolomics Innovation Resource. So this is an area where we do what's called mass spectrometry. And we measure metabolites. So we look at cancer as a metabolic disease in this facility. And uh, if you think about it, it 
and it makes sense because cancer cells need to grow. In order to double, they have to change their metabolism so that they take up nutrients from the environment so they can reproduce. So in this laboratory here, we look at all of the small molecules of the things that cancer cells eat or don't eat or how they change so that they can live in different environments. So if you have a cancer that starts in one tissue, ends up in the other tissue, so say breast cancer going to brain, we can measure the differences on how that changes. We can also measure the metabolic pathways that the cancer cells use in order to grow and to survive in this stressful environment. So if you look around, um, there's a few of us here, but we have quite a few instruments. And um, what else can I say? Cancer cells, cancer in our, in our world here, is uh, probably, or we think of it as a metabolic disease. So we're trying to learn how the cancer cells fuel themselves in order to survive and reproduce. Cool. So thanks to Dana, <laughs> even though she's not here. Um, and so next up, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Daniela Quayle. Um, she is a professor here in the Department of Physiology. She is also a principal investigator within the Goodman Cancer Research Center. Um, I think she'll tell you a little bit more about this, but she started her lab in August of 2017. And she also holds a tier two Canada research chair in tumor microenvironment research. So um, Dr. Quayle, I will pass it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about my job as a professor at uh, the Goodman Cancer Research Center and at McGill. Um, a little bit first about how I got to this position. I did my PhD at the University of Western Ontario, um, completed my degree in 2012 um, in the Department of Anatomy and Cell Biology, and I really chose to do my degree um, there based on the research that was going on in the lab that I joined. So I was really interested in some research being done by a professor there named um, Lynn Marie Postovit. Mm -hmm. She had really cool animal models where she could inject cancer cells into fish and they would grow two heads. And I just thought that was like science fiction. And so I wanted to learn more about that. Um, so I, I did my PhD in about four and a half years, and then I subsequently, if you could um, go to the next slide, thank you. Um, I subsequently did my postdoc at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. So um, this was a really amazing experience. I, I met lifelong friends. I had tons of fun. Um, but importantly, the research for a scientist was like, it was like being in a playground. Every piece of equipment that you could imagine, everything was kind of like brand new and, and shiny. And, uh, you know, people from all different disciplines all coming together to study cancer. And I got to live in Manhattan. There was tons of energy in the city, um, you know, met a lot of really cool people outside of my job. Um, and as Gabrielle said, the uh, culture within research is very multi um, disciplinary. It's also um, very diverse. I think in my time in New York, I only knew maybe two Americans. Uh, most people were from all over the world. So that was a really cool experience. Um, next, thank you, you're, you're ahead of me. <laughs> um, I started my lab at the Goodman Cancer Research Center at McGill. Um, so that was after about four, four and a half years doing my postdoc. Um, and that's where I am now. I started my lab in 2017. Um, I, it's a pretty small group of people. Right now I have about uh, five or six graduate students um, and uh, we study the tumor microenvironment and it's an extension of the work that I did as a postdoc. Um, so you can go to the next slide, please. So one thing that was really uh, kind of shocking to me in the transition from going from a, a postdoc to a faculty member is that the day-to-day -day looks completely different. So um, when I was a trainee, I was at the bench every day, um, you know, putting in long, hard hours, trying to get my experiments, it's previous slide actually, thank you, um, trying to get my experiments finished. Um, and as a PI, my day looks very different. So I spend a lot of time preparing talks, a lot of time writing grants, 
um, and a lot of time thinking about how to uh, best formulate um, presentations for lectures, for classes in the university. Um, we also do a lot of uh, administrative work, which kind of um, goes towards contributing to the university um, as a whole. So this is an example of, of something that's part of my job, trying to promote science to young women. Um, and we also are involved in, for example, core facility development. So really as a PI, you kind of have three pillars of your job. It's research, um, but again, it's not at the bench anymore. It's, it's more from kind of a, a thinking and grant writing perspective. Um, and then there's teaching and then there's service. So that's, that's how my job has transitioned now um, from being a postdoc. You can go to the next slide. Um, one of the perks of being in academia is you get to travel to a lot of different places. Um, this is a map of all the places that I've, I've been um, since starting uh, between my postdoc and my and just starting my lab in 2017. So it hasn't been that many years considering how many places I've, I've been able to see. Um, the benefit is, I mean, it's obvious that traveling is fun, uh, but also you get to meet so many different people with so many different backgrounds, so many different perspectives. Um, and as a consequence of this, you kind of build a network around the world. And so, and as a consequence of that, you get, to, you know, invited to give seminars in different places. Um, you can write grants with people from different places. And so it's really an international community that you start to feel part of. You can go to the next slide. Um, another thing that I spend a lot of time doing is writing. Um, I did a minor in philosophy when I was uh, uh, doing my bachelor degree and I, that came up in conversation in one of the earlier presentations is what kinds of skills are important as a scientist. Without question, writing is very important and it might not be something that you think of right away, um, but the job ends up being a lot of writings and, and I love writing. So this is something that I really love about my job. Um, I've been really fortunate to be able to write um, a lot of um, different review articles, which is when you kind of summarize the research that's been done in the field and give your opinion on what are the new directions and um, the conclusions based on lots of different research instead of just one piece of research. And so that's been really um, an exciting part of my job. Um, and I also spend a lot of time writing grants. And so these are you know, reviews talk about summarize data and, and research that's already been done and a grant summarizes your ideas and what you're going to do in the future. Um, and that's a really uh, tedious part of part of the job, but it's a really rewarding part because that's when you really kind of network and work together with your colleagues and the students in your lab and postdocs to try to come up with the best ideas, the best approaches to answer those ideas. Um, and then you get evaluated and see whether you get funding or not. So that's, that's uh, where I spend probably the most of my time. Next slide. Um, I do want to say that it is a really uh, difficult and, and kind of long term and strenuous commitment. So you saw Gabrielle's timeline, it does span quite a lot of years. Um, but it's also a lot of fun. So it does have this balance. And I think that a lot of the kind of uh, difficult parts of my training, kind of when I look back at it now, they're like rites of passage. So I have a couple of memorable moments that I wanted to share with you. Um, I once did an experiment that required 29 hours of intensive work. It ended at 5 a.m. I did it with one other person in my lab. Um, and when the experiment ended, instead of going home, I mean, we were in New York, so everything was open all the time. Um, we went out for breakfast and had mimosas and celebrated being finished. So that was, uh, you know, instead of being such a grueling experience, it was quite fun. Um, I once slept in my lab and set a timer every two hours so I could take images of my cells. Um, when I was in New York, I was there during Hurricane Sandy, which was a horrifying hurricane, even in Manhattan. Um, but I had mice. I was dedicated to checking them. I wanted to make sure that they were not um, suffering and that they were okay. And so I uh, walked along the street and held onto the stair railings on everybody's stoop in order to not get blown away just so that I could get there and, and check on my mice. Um, for a year of my postdoc, I gave cancer drugs orally to about 100 mice twice a day. So you can imagine how much time this is handling mice and taking care of them. Um, when I was a postdoc, I was giving a presentation at an international meeting and, you know, I wasn't used to giving talks at that time and my laptop crashed the morning of my talk and I had to redo all of my slides in a frantic panic. I can see Gabrielle shaking her head because that's everybody's nightmare, but it worked out. It was fine. Um, and then last, revisions are really hard. So when you submit a manuscript to get published, 
usually after a month or two, um, reviewers will give you comments and they come back and it's kind of like a mad scramble for the next four to six months to try to address all of the things, the questions that the reviewers have. And then you resubmit the manuscript and they decide, did you do a good job or a bad job answering the questions? Should it be published or should it not be published? So this is like the moment in a trainee's career to you know, really step up to the plate so that you get that high impact paper. And during those phases, you know, it would last about six months oftentimes and sometimes even more. Um, I'd be putting in 16 hour days every day just to make sure that those papers got published. And it was certainly grueling and it was you know, stressful and there, was, there were a lot of tears, but in the end I got two awesome papers out of my postdoc um, and those which, which are on the slide here. And those were really the basis for what gave me the flexibility to have different job options and, and uh, things available to me. Next slide. So kind of, I don't wanna just talk about all the hardships and why they're you know, in retrospect uh, um, kind of fun to think about, but there's also a lot of benefits um, you know, socially. I, I think because science can be such a challenging discipline, it really brings people together. So in the upper left-hand side of the uh, screen, this is a picture of my lab during my postdoc. Um, and just in, this, in the picture just below it, that's a picture of all of us, you know, we've all started our labs in different parts of the world now, and we're still very close. And this is, you know, we had a Zoom um, meeting just to catch up over drinks uh, very recently. So it's been a really cool experience to see all of your closest friends kind of start their labs in different parts of the world, and you're all connected now around the world. Again, we invite each other to seminars, we write grants together. So that's been really cool to know somebody in all these different countries. Um, in my lab now, we're involved in lots of um, kind of uh, team or group uh, initiatives. We get involved in Candorel and Terry Fox runs. Um, my students compete in poster presentations and when they get awarded um, uh, awards for their posters or their seminars and you know, they celebrate. Um, my students have been involved in imaging competitions. Um, and recently to kind of kill time during the, the pandemic, we've also had Zoom cocktail making classes where we've all participated in, in making fancy cocktails together. So we do work really hard, but I think, like I said, because of those hardships, you really become close with the people in your lab and they will be people that you keep in touch with forever. Next slide. Um, and I just want to close by emphasizing that science really needs you guys. So these are statistics from Canada um, showing the proportion of women who are in natural sciences and engineering uh, disciplines. Um, so my discipline is biological and biomedical science. This is the red line um, on the left, yeah, on the left graph. And you can see only about 20 to 25 percent of people in this discipline um, are women. So we're very underrepresented. And if you look at the graph on the right, um, these are kind of the academic rankings going by, uh, going from assistant professor to associate and to full professor. These are, it doesn't mean that you're an assistant professor or like an assistant to a professor. These are just kind of the um, traditional academic rankings as you go through the tenure appointments. Um, and you can see again, we're very underrepresented. And in fact, if you look at the proportion of women who are full professors, it falls under 15%. And the reason this is so important, I don't want to deter, make this deter you from going to science. I think if anything, it should encourage you from going into science. You know, these are, um, these are scientists for all of health, you know, reproductive health, women's health, um, that influences policy. Um, you also have to think about, you know, the people who are full professors who are making the rules about um, your tenure, about um, your grants and your manuscripts getting reviewed, uh, favor favorably or unfavorably. Um, you know, what, what are the requirements for tenure and does it incorporate um, consideration about whether you've had a child in the last few years, which is often the case um, for women who are either in a postdoc or early professorship. These decisions are all being made primarily by men, you know, and so it's really important that we get more women involved in the sciences because you have a real opportunity to make a difference in these fields. Um, and it's absolutely critical for the success of this, of this uh, discipline. So I'll end there. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat or, or ask. Awesome, thank you so much. That was yeah, great. Thank you so much, Daniela. That was wonderful. So yeah, again, if you have any questions for Daniela, please put it in the chat. Um, but in the meantime, we will move on to Sarah Martin. 
Um, so she is going to talk to us about what it's like to be in an MD PhD program. She did her bachelor's and master's at Queen's University, where I am also from. Um, and she is now doing her MD PhD in the Department of Experimental Medicine at McGill. So take it away, Sarah. Thank you so much. So hi everyone, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for having me. So as was just mentioned, I am in McGill's combined MD PhD program where I'm training to be what is called a clinician scientist. So today I'll be talking to you about what exactly that means as well as my research, uh, which focuses on brain metastasis. Yeah, next slide please. Thank you so much. So what are clinician scientists? So formally, they can be defined as physicians who, in addition to their clinical duties, also dedicate a substantial part of their career to research. And so a lot of people see this as wearing two hats, where one day you're a doctor in a clinic seeing patients, and the next day you're a researcher in the lab. And while there's some truth to that, I personally prefer to think of it as wearing a single hat that lets you have insight into both worlds. So when you're in the clinic seeing patients and interpreting medical problems, you're able to see them as research questions. And then when you're in the lab, you're thinking about how your research work can apply actually to the patients that you're seeing. So this career path involves, uh, involves obtaining both an MD as well as research training of some sort, which is usually a PhD. In a combined program like mine, it is a seven to eight year journey where you learn a lot of different skills. You have your clinic skills, your lab skills, and then what I consider the most important set of skills, your investigative thinking skills, which allows you to do all of this problem solving, both in the clinic and in the research world. And so one of the goals to being a clinician scientist is to perform what is called bench to bedside research, where the discoveries made at the lab bench make their way to the patients at the bedside. An example of this is my PhD work with brain metastases. Next slide, thank you. So brain metastases are a complication of late stage cancer where a tumor in another part of the body migrates and makes its way to the brain. This most commonly occurs with lung cancer, breast cancer, and skin cancer. And 90% of tumors found in the brain are in fact brain metastases. So they are in, unfortunately relatively common. So the current treatment plans for brain metastases are surgery and radiation which as we all know, radiation has its whole slew of negative side effects. So however, despite this treatment, up to 60% of tumors come back. So we started to ask the question, why do some of these tumors come back or recur? And is there a subpopulation of tumors that are more likely to recur? Next slide, please. So to answer this, we started working with a neurosurgeon who was able to help us get some of the tissues from the brain metastasis surgeries that he does. So when we looked at the tissues, we saw that tumors grew in two patterns. So the four squares that you see on the left are two different types of tumors that we stained to make the tumor cells shown in darker purple, so pointed to by the black arrows, um, in contrast to the lighter pink, which is pointed to by the green arrows, uh, which is just the normal brain. So when you look at the upper two images, you see a clear border between the tumor and the normal brain, which we show just with that dotted black line. And this type of, thank you, and this type of pattern we called minimally invasive. On the bottom squares, you see that you have the purple tumor cells that are kind of growing in clusters and invading into the brain. So we saw that and we're calling this pattern highly invasive. So we ended up looking at 164 samples and found that in 66% of them grew in this highly invasive pattern. Next slide, please. So what was really interesting was when we looked at how the patients did after their treatment. We found that patients who we classified as minimally invasive with this blue line up at the top there, you see that all 100% of these patients had no tumor come back in three years after their surgery. This is in contrast to the red line, which represents these highly invasive patients, suggesting that the highly invasive patients are more likely to have their tumor recur. So this suggests that this highly invasive growth pattern is associated with local tumor recurrence. So what does this mean for patients? Well, we are thinking that it could change the treatment plans for brain metastasis patients. Like I mentioned, the current treatment is both surgery and radiation. And with radiation comes all of those negative side effects. A possible change to this is to start categorizing patients into these two different patterns, this highly invasive versus this minimally invasive, and then adjusting the treatment plan accordingly. 
So for patients with this highly invasive growth pattern, perhaps they may still get surgery and radiation. But for patients with this minimally invasive pattern, perhaps give them surgery only, and then avoid all of those negative radiation side effects. So this idea in, uh, is currently in clinical trial, and we're actually incredibly excited to have this go to clinical trial and have a direct impact on patient care. So this is an example of this bench to bedside approach that I mentioned at the start. So this goal of clinician scientists, where you see patients in the clinic, you're formulating a research question that you then bring to the lab, you obtain your research findings that can hopefully go back to the bedside and then help change treatment plans. So this is the career that I am embarking on and I'm incredi incredibly excited about. Next slide, please. So thank you so much for listening. Um, I would like to really quickly thank the entire Siegel Lab, which is who I work with in the Goodman Cancer Research Center, and particularly Matthew Denkner and then Kevin Petreka as their instrumentals in this project. I'm happy to take any questions. Cool, thank you so much, Sarah. That's really awesome. Um, I, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, we're just gonna move on to our last presenter. I know we're a few minutes behind, but Sherry has some really cool work that she's gonna tell us about. So I'm gonna quickly introduce her. Sherry is a PhD student. She is also in the Department of Physiology and she is passionate about health and wellness. So I'll let you take it away, Sherry. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction, Gabe. Um, so yeah, I'm a PhD student here at the Goodman Cancer Research Center. Um, I'm actually in Daniela's lab, um, the, the assistant professor who spoke uh, to two people before. Um, and today I'm just gonna tell you about what I study in the lab, um, which is more sort of basic research. Um, and we try and see whether or not there's any translational relevance to like basic lab findings um, from work we do. And I look specifically at the relationship between obesity and cancer. Um, next slide. So I'll just start by telling you guys some uh, super basic statistics. So currently on a global scale, more people are actually overweight or obese than underweight. Um, in North America, for example, presently 30% of individuals are obese, another 30% are overweight, and interestingly, of the remaining 40% of healthy weight individuals, about one in five of them are actually metabolically obese. And this just denotes individuals who have a healthy weight and body mass, um, but they have some metabolic characteristics that actually increase their risk of developing some serious health conditions in the same way that obesity does. So it's actually a very um, prevalent condition that is increasing. Um, and a lot of studies have actually shown that obesity is associated with increased incidence of cancer, as well as increased relative risk of death from um, a number of different cancers. Um, next. So my PhD project then assesses how exactly, like what is the relationship between obesity and cancer? And what I'm um, particularly interested in studying is firstly, how do fat cells affect the growth of cancer cells? Um, secondly, I also want to know how do fat cells affect the spread of cancer cells from the circulation to vital organs such as the lung? And thirdly, how do cancer cells affect other cell types such as immune cells to allow this process to happen? And again, my, my research is very basic, so I study a lot of things at a sort of cellular level, looking at the interaction between tumor cells and immune cells and um, endothelial cells within the blood vessel. And in the lab, I use a number of different um, techniques to address these questions. So for example, the first thing I can do is I can culture cancer cells in different states that kind of mimic the obese versus lean condition and then compare how do these tumor cells interact in the two. I can also um, get blood samples from, again, obese and lean samples and analyze the immune cells uh, within the two to try and um, derive differences and potential uh, mechanisms that may be at play. And then finally, I can um, stain patient samples from patients who are obese versus lean and look um, using a fluorescence microscope to see, you know, what cell types are present, how are they interacting, and try and draw some um, correlations from that using both fluorescent microscopy and another technology called imaging mass cytometry where um, I get some really cool images um, and you can hit next. Yeah, and um, you can kind of see like how many cell types are present within different samples, where are they located? And from that, you can derive um, a lot of cool information. Um, so I'm just gonna show you guys some of my results now. So what's shown here, um, these images were acquired using that technology, imaging mass cytometry, and it's a tumor sample from an obese patient versus a lean patient. Um, this is just a representative image, and you see that the DNA is um, all of your cells, it's stained in blue, 
um, and your cancer cells specifically are stained in green. And then there's a specialized immune cell called a neutrophil, which is stained in pink. And what you can see and what we see is that in obese patients, there are more of these um, immune cells called neutrophils compared to in lean patients. And what we found is that these immune cells are actually helping uh, cancer cells spread in obese patients from the blood to organs such as the lung. And the way they're doing this is actually by releasing toxic factors into the environment that act on um, endothelial cells in blood vessels that allow them to spread from the blood to organs such as the lung. And um, why exactly is this important then, um, this finding? Well, the long-term impact of this is that the majority, a lot of cancer types, for example, breast cancer, which is the cancer that I study, Patients don't die from this cancer because of the primary tumor in the breast. They die because this cancer spreads to other organs such as the lung, the liver, the brain. And what we found is that in this specific case, um, these neutrophils are producing toxic factors. We can actually target these toxic factors and block them from being released. And this can actually reduce the spread of cancer to organs such as the lung. And the translational relevance of this is that if we can block, if we can prevent cancer from spreading from the breast to vital organs like the lung, the liver, the brain, we can reduce death from this devastating disease, which is the ultimate goal of my research and what I hope to accomplish. Um, so it's, it's a very rewarding field to be in, I would say. Um, I, I thoroughly enjoy my research and I really do hope to um, make an impact and, um, you know, long term, my goal is to try and reduce death from this this condition that um, afflicts a lot of people. So it's a really, it's a really fun field to be in. You get to do a lot of cool research and it has, um, it, it, it's very um, rewarding. So with that, thank you. And I can take any questions you, you all may have. Cool, thanks so much, Sherry, that's really cool. Um, so we had one more video to show you, which is of the histology core at the GCRC. Um, but I'm not going to show it to you because we're already running over time. So I promise to send along the video to your teachers and that hopefully if you are interested, you can see what exactly the histology core looks like. So before we wrap up, I just wanted to say that we hope you took some things out of this experience. The first and most important is that science is super cool and everyone should think science is really cool for different reasons and that there's all kinds of different scientific career options that you can go into even if you um, if you decide to pursue science. You have all kinds of transferable skills. Um, and so that's everything from, um, from us. A huge thank you to our speakers and I think I'm passing it over to Tunde. True? Yes, thank you so much, Gabe. This was an absolutely mind-blowingly amazing uh, presentation from everyone. I am very, very impressed. Uh, I would like to say thank you to you, Gabe and Mara. You guys did, as I said, a fantastic job to put this together. Uh, I would also like to say thank you uh, for Dr. Daniela Creel to taking the time from her busy schedule and talking to us. This was very interesting. Uh, I would also like to say thank you to, to Dana to making the short video. I think I, I think I've never been in the in the um, uh, core facility uh, in the metabolomics core facility. Uh, thank you also Sarah and and Sherry to talking about your research. They both extremely exciting and I really really hope that that uh, you guys will succeed. I think you have all the all the good push and skills and, and knowledge. And again, thank you so much. This was, this was fantastic. Uh, so in the name of the, the Young Women in Bio, um, thank you again and hope you uh, see you guys soon. See you guys. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks, and, guys. and send us questions if you have questions. We're happy to answer them. Take care, everyone.